This is an overview of case law. Before we start talking about case law, let's first understand that our law comes from a variety of sources. We've got constitutional law. We've got laws and statutes. We have rules and regulations. And then we have case law, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And then, of course, there are ordinances that are passed by uh, municipalities, by cities, and sometimes even by counties. Now, a little bit more background. Let's talk a little before we talk about uh, case law. Let's understand that uh, or remember that probably in high school government or civics class that we were taught that there's a separation of powers that uh, we have uh, the legislative branch, that's Congress or the legislature, and they make the laws. And then we have the executive branch, and the executive branch, well, that's the governor or the president and, and the bureaucracy that they oversee, and they enforce the law. And then we were told in our high school civics class that, that we have the judicial branches, the third branch of government, and they interpret the law. And uh, what I'm here to tell you is that uh, that's not necessarily true, a separation of powers is what political scientists might call a separation of personnel. But the truth of the matter is, legislative branch, they make laws called statutes. The executive branch, the, the governor, the president, the bureaucracy, they make rules and regulations and ex uh, that, are have, that are law. And uh, so they just don't enforce the law. They actually make law. And then the judicial branch, uh, the law that, that is generated by the judicial branch comes out of the cases that the, branch, that, the, that the courts hear. And so we call that case law. So that's what we're here to talk about today, and that's the background. Bottom line is judges do make law. There's always a lot of debate about that, but in reality, judges make law. All right, let's talk about the common law. Once again, the common law is a body of law that is basically case law. It's judge-made law, and it's followed in the United Kingdom, where it, where it had its uh, origins. It's also followed in the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, all places that were settled and colonized by uh, folks coming from the United Kingdom. Uh, it began to develop this thing we call the common law, began to develop uh, with the Norman uh, conquest in uh, 1066. And as the, uh, th they took over the country and began to uh, uh, solidify the way law was made and law was decided and took over the local customs and established a more nationwide approach of principles of law. And of course, there was no parliament. There were, there were no statutes, no ordinances, because there was no parliament, uh, no legislative body. All you had was the king, and the king would, would appoint uh, judges to hear disputes. The king could, could hear all the disputes, of course, and, and could issue decrees. But what the king would do is, is appoint judges to go out through the countryside and, and hear disputes. And the judges would have to figure out a way, well, how do I decide who's right and who's wrong in this dispute? And so these judges basically relied on their own sense of right and wrong, but they also relied on how other judges before them had decided very similar cases. So as they heard the, dis the disputes, they would try to be consistent in, in the decisions that they made, always looking back at other previous cases, which we now, of course, call precedent. And so over time, that approach developed into a, a, a body of law that uh, came into being Pretty much like a, I like to use the analogy of a coral reef. Uh, you know, one case at a time. What's a coral reef? Well, it's it's a um, a collection of many, many, many dead animals, small, small uh, shell animals, one on top of the other. And well, that's pretty much the way case law has developed and continues to develop over the last several hundred years. Uh, in, in these countries. And so, so it's an accumulation of a history of uh, uh, 
legal judicial decision making. And that brings us to this concept of stare decisis, or some people say uh, stare decisis, or stare decisis. Uh, in Latin, it means let the decision stand. And it's this notion that judges, as I said on the previous board, that judges will uh, follow the decisions of previous judges on previous cases that had very similar facts and circumstances. And this, this concept of stare decisis also means that a decision by a higher court in a particular jurisdiction will then be binding on all the lower courts in that jurisdiction. But what about court decisions from other jurisdictions? What if you're in a, in a jurisdiction, you have a type of a case that you can't find a, uh, uh, a similar case, a controlling case, precedent in, in your jurisdiction? What are you going to do? Well, if you find one in a neighboring jurisdiction, another jurisdiction, it can be used persuasively to, pers to persuade the judge in your case. So, that's, so cases from uh, courts in other jurisdictions, they're certainly not going to be binding on the courts in, in your jurisdiction, but they may be what we call persuasive authority. Um, Now, as I was saying, judges look for similar cases, or, or lawyers who are advocating for their client look for similar cases to convince the judge that the, the, the controversy they're working on uh, is very, very similar to this other case that happened years ago, or maybe just last week, that would control the outcome in their case. They're looking for similar cases, but not all cases that a lawyer that the lawyers come up with that they cite as controlling are, ne are necessarily going to be controlling. I mean, who decides that? Well, the judge. But, but they, they may not be close enough in similarity with the facts and, uh, to, to, in the opinion of the judge, to control the outcome of the case that the judge is hearing. So what lawyers do, particularly if the other lawyer comes up with a case, uh, that, that is not particularly beneficial to you, you try to distinguish uh, the case that that lawyer is citing th from the case that you're trying to argue. So we're constantly distinguishing cases, and that goes along with this, this notion of stare, stare decisis or stare decisis. Well, which, which cases actually do control? Which cases uh, should we allow the decision to stand and control in, in our particular case. Now, let me give you an example here. Uh, you, you a parent? If you're not a parent, you were a child. Uh, example would be your, your child comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I want to go to Billy's house. And you say, no, you can't go to Billy's house. What have you just done? You've made a decision. All right, the child's going to say, but well, you, you let Bobby go over there. What did your child just do? He cited precedence to you. Okay? Kids aren't stupid. And so, but what is you as a smart parent going to do? Yeah, but your brother is, what, older or did his homework or whatever. What are you doing? You're distinguishing the two cases. All right, well, that's what lawyers do. We distinguish cases as we apply the, the doctrine of stare decisis as it relates to the common law and case law. And so that's a summary of uh, case law and where it came from and what we do with it.